Uh, this is Rob Fleetwood. I'm a partner at Barrick Verrazano and want to welcome everyone to today's call. Um, we appreciate you guys taking time out um, of your busy schedule to listen to us and, and hopefully get some insight on what we're experiencing with our clients. Um, a big thank you to uh, RSM as well as Piper Sandler for, uh, for, for uh, joining this. I know we've got a lot of different uh, people uh, on this call in different geographies. So the presenters are all in, uh, in Illinois, so we are all working from home. But I know there's many of you who are in uh, different states with different rules right now, so uh, hopefully you are uh, back at work and um, uh, living the, uh, the new normal that I know us in Chicago want to uh, be living uh, as soon as we can. Um, a few opening remarks before I turn it to John Berenger for his thoughts. Um, you know, 12 years ago, uh, Barrick and RSM got together and started doing a series of webinars when we were going through the, the session. Um, and they were, I think, well received. Um, we got a lot of great feedback on it. We tried to keep them as practical as we could and give some, some good insight. Um, we turned it after and we came out of that event and started hosting an annual uh, all-day seminar. Um, again, usually it was in Oak Brook. Um, we did a couple up in Milwaukee as well. And that was what was scheduled for today. Um, and obviously, in light of the uh, current events, we're unable to meet in person, so we thought we'd kind of go full circle and move it back to a webinar. So. The goal today is to try to be um, conversational, to try to cover as many topics as we can in an hour and a half, and kind of give you guys, uh, the, the, the listeners, kind of the insight of what um, the attorneys and accountants and um, uh, investment bankers are seeing out there and what we're, um, what we're advising and talking to our clients about. So for today, um, the speakers, uh, again, I'm Rob Fleetwood, um, so I'm with Barrick Ferrazano, and for those who uh, don't know us, we're a, a firm headquartered in Chicago. We have a, a large financial institutions group. We have 250 or so uh, community and regional banks that we advise um, and have been talking to throughout this, uh, this process. Um, again, I do corporate and securities. On things, so I do M&A and security capital raises and dealing with boards of directors. Uh, my partner John Garinger heads up our regulatory practice, and he's a former regulator, which uh, is always helpful. Um, and he's been dealing with our clients on uh, navigating through um, some of the regulatory issues uh, that have been cropping up and, and communicating with the regulators on, on their position on things. Um, Lynn makes Reardon is a partner who deals with employment and executive compensation matters. And she spent a lot of time over the past couple of weeks dealing with our bank clients on planning um, and kind of mitigating risks of bringing employees back to the workforce when, uh, when we're able to do so. And then uh, Stan Orzula is a partner who is really taken the lead on the government programs, particularly PPP, uh, which we'll be talking about in some of the other um, SBA programs that are out there. Um, I'll pause for a moment, maybe kick it over to John Freecheck. Uh, John, give us a little bit of background or introduction of, uh, of um, you at uh, Piper Sandler. Yeah, thank you, Rob. And uh, this is John Freecheck with Piper Sandler. Uh, we are an investment banking firm headquartered up in Minneapolis. Uh, as Rob alluded to a moment ago, I'm in the Chicago office here with, uh, with the rest of the uh, speaking crew. And um, we are, uh, Piper Sandler was formed back in January. It feels like ages ago, but uh, only been about four months now in the merger between Piper Jaffrey and Sandler O'Neill. And so I'll be providing the investment banking perspective uh, on the call today and focusing on the uh, mergers and acquisitions and uh, capital markets activity that we've been seeing uh, over the past couple of months here. Uh, and so uh, John Berenger, I'll kick it over to you to give a little bit of color on the RSM team. Great, thanks John. Uh, this is John Berenger, good morning to all of you. 
And uh, as Rob uh, stated, would like to echo, appreciate you joining us today. Uh, in lieu of being able to be in person uh, in Oak Brook today as we originally planned. Uh, for those of you not familiar with RSM, we are the fifth largest accounting firm in the United States, headquartered in Chicago, uh, and our focus is really being the leading firm for the middle market and, and how that translates in the financial institution space is we work with 1,200 uh, institutions on an annual basis, really in the community banking, as well as the regional and super regional uh, banking space. Uh, through our 90 plus offices across the United States. I'm a risk consulting partner based here in Chicago, uh, but have a national responsibility whereby I lead our national uh, financial institution consulting practice. So have had the opportunity to not only see Great Lakes, and I know many of you sit in the Great Lakes dialed in today, but, but also we have folks as Rob alluded to from all over uh, the US. So we'll share what we're hearing and seeing um, from our clients here uh, across the country, really. And with that, I, I've asked, and he was kind enough to accept, uh, Dina Postolopoulos, uh, who's an audit partner here based in Chicago. And Dean, uh, the focus of his practice is really exclusively in the community banking space, uh, where he works with several public filers as well as uh, several non-public uh, community financial institutions. So uh, we're looking forward to a good conversation today. Uh, as Rob alluded to, we're going to try and hit a lot of topics in 90 minutes, and we're actually down to 80 already here. Um, so what we're going to ask is please use the Q&A button. Uh, it, it's a function at the bottom of your screen. You should be able to see uh, just under the slide to enter questions. Rob and I will be uh, coordinating and asking questions as time allows uh, based on what populates uh, the Q&A uh, queue. And then to the extent we run out of time, uh, we commit to you that we'll go ahead and get responses uh, for those questions uh, typed up and included with the slides, which will be sent following uh, the webcast to those who registered. So with that, I'm going to hand it back to Rob as we uh, jump into our first topic. Thanks, John. Um, let's flip over to uh, the first slide here, Michelle. Uh, Michelle uh, Rutz is our uh, marketing um, guru who's going to be running the slide program here. Um, I'll kick it over to, to Stan and John Geringer. Um, as many of you know who attend the, uh, the annual one, we've got a Behringer Geringer report. Um, that will not be on this program to everyone's dismay. They've been furloughed for a little bit of time. But we'll uh, we'll uh, uh, they'll they'll have some back and forth uh, regardless. But um, Stan, open it to you and and talk about what you've been seeing and some of the key issues, um, including the news and some of the FAQs that came out this morning on PPP and and the other programs. Great, thank you very much for the introduction, Rob. Um, first of all, I'd like to start off with the uh, Paycheck Protection Program. PPP or triple P if people thought. And the first thing I want to say about it, after talking to our clients in putting it together and implementing it, it's amazing to see that many of our banking clients have worked through the night, 18 hour days, to ensure that their customers are able to obtain PPP loans. And it's really sort of an amazing effort and I think really shows the value of relationship uh, banking um, because they, they really got it done. Um, so, so where are we right now? Um, as we talk about implementation, we are in round two. Um, as everybody knows, there was a first round of about $350 billion, which ran out really, really quickly. And then there were um, a second round of funding. And as of today, we believe that there's about $100 billion. So what's interesting about the second round of funding is that it, there, there were certain limits placed on it. Um, so as that the money would go to smaller borrowers and smaller financial institutions. And um, although the program runs till June 30th, uh, it's, it seems like that anybody that would want or is, um, requires a PPP loan will probably be able to get it, as, again, assuming they qualify and they're, they're able to apply. Um, so I think that that's, that's really good where we are right now. Um, so even though we been through the first stage of PPP, um, where banks are already looking at the next stage. 
And that next stage is forgiveness. Um, and the issue with forgiveness is, is that, um, quite frankly, the guidance from the SBA uh, and Treasury has not been very clear. And it, it appears that it has the potential to be changing uh, almost, you know, almost every, every day. Um, but one of the, there's been a huge development that Rob mentioned um, with respect to um, forgiveness that came out today. Um, the SBA has been publishing a series of FAQs and we've tried to track those by publishing um, PPP FAQs um, on BFKN's uh, website. But um, FAQ number 46, which came out today, um, literally an, an hour ago, so we're, we're still digesting it, um, talks about necessity. Um, necessity is one of the um, requirements for an SBA loan. And, and, and in a nutshell, uh, necessity is that your business or uh, the, the party applying for a PPP loan has been affected by COVID-19. Well, it's been, a, it's been a pretty broad standard. However, there were, after the first round of PPP funding, there was a lot of blowback against some larger publicly held um, uh, companies and also um, certain ones um, owned by um, private equity, and including some restaurant chains that um, obtained PPP loans where there was a public outcry because they, there was the impression that, that by taking those funds, it took away from, from other borrowers and, and that, that those restaurant chains could have obtained money either through the, the market and, and whatnot. Well, what the SBA came out today is um, with an, an, a new guidance regarding necessity. And basically what it says, if a borrower or if it's along with its affiliates using the SBA affiliation standards, of course, uh, if they have PPP loans under $2 million in the aggregate, the borrower will be deemed to have made the necessity certification in good faith. So for, for this, that, that's a big change because it seems like that once you, a borrower applied and certified that they were making it in good faith, that um, th that answer is resolved and that the SBA is going to take it in, in face value. Now, it remains to be seen if the SBA does individual audits on borrowers under $2 million and we'll see if they, they change their, their tune because as everyone knows, regulators sometimes have, have shorter memories. And, um, but, but for now, that, that is the written guidance. Now for PPP borrowers over, uh, with PPP loans over 2 million, um, they may still have an adequate basis in making that certification, which, which is good. Um, so if you have a PPP borrower that was really affected by, by the recent events and the loans over 2 million, they can certi uh, certify it in good faith. And even more importantly is that the SBA sort of set the $2 million bar as sort of their baseline audit level, where I think where they'll be looking at PPP loans over $2 million um, really closely. And Basically, what they said too is that for the two million and above borrowers, if they do do an audit and it turns out that um, the necessity wasn't quite there, or the SBA feels that it doesn't make the necessity, um, the SBA is just going to say, "Well, you're not eligible for forgiveness." So, so what's the what's the remedy for that? Well, the borrower will have to repay the loan uh, with interest, which is a, a whopping one percent. Um, and also too, if the borrower pays that money money um, back right away, the SBA won't will not take any enforcement actions. Now this is interesting because the SBA originally had a May seventh, which was later extended to May fourteenth, so called amnesty date for these larger borrowers to turn to repay that money. Well, what this says here is for those larger borrowers, they will have to weigh because every borrower has to make their own decision, they have to certify themselves, um, they will have to um, decide for themselves, you know, whether to just pay the money now or wait for, or wait for the audit if they have a good faith basis for um, uh, obtaining the loan. So it seems to me that there, this puts a lot less pressure on um, borrowers that think that are maybe overcautious um, to, to determine whether or not um, they should 
repay the loan before that May 14th safe harbor date, which is tomorrow. So I think, I think that's a really, really interesting and a really big de development. And I expect banks to be receiving calls from their customers, although it's, it's up to the bank customer and, and the bank customer should, should consult with their own professionals rather than a bank giving out advice on the loans. The second part of loan forgiveness is that um, now, now that all these loans are made, we're, banks are, we're still waiting from the SBA to determine what the uh, calculation methods are and how far a bank will have to um, dive into that. Um, since those calculations are, are unknown at, at the present time and, and haven't been firmed up by the SBA, um, we will just have to wait and, and see what they are. Our, our hope is that they don't place a, an undue burden on banks whereby they have to do a deep forensic dive on their borrowers to determine that they're eligible. We are hopeful through the um, lobbying efforts of the banking associations and, and, and other methods that banks should be able to be able to rely on a borrower certification on the forgiveness part. So this is an issue to, to keep an eye out that it's probably going to be developing over the, the next few weeks. Yeah, and Stan, good point on, on kind of figuring out what deep, deep of a dive banks need or should be doing for their own um, diligence and, and protection. And, and maybe John Berenger, you might have some ideas about documentation and things that you've seen your clients doing to um, deal with those types of issues. Yeah, thanks, Rob. And I think the key as we've been talking through it with clients is being flexible and agile in responding to the evolution. I, I thought of, of, of the rules around the pro, uh, program. You know, I thought it was telling, I'm sure many of you saw yesterday, the wall street journal had an article and, and I liked the quote from the head of the national association uh, for government guaranteed lenders. And he said, the feedback really from uh, Capitol Hill and around has been, we've been building the plane as we fly. And I, I think that's, for all of us who've been either directly involved, our, you know, our, our bank clients or those of us as, as practitioners who've been advising, it sure feels that way. Um, so with that, I think there's a couple of things we can do uh, and we saw banks do on the front end and then certainly we'll, we'll expect to see again on uh, the forgiveness side, which is controls, right? There's some basic controls we're gonna need to have in place around the approval process and certainly around you know our good faith recalculations and what we did as an institution uh to you know as required by the guidance i think the other side of it with forgiveness is i would be more cautious and, and what we've been advising clients on is it was kind of all hands on deck uh, in the initial rounds to get the loans processed i think from a forgiveness standpoint making sure you have folks that are a little bit more uh, detail oriented, certainly trained in, in some aspects of loan ops will be helpful to just review and really make sure all the documentation is there. And then as Stan alluded to, given we're not sure and how the SBA will ultimately uh, review or audit the loans that were made, I think it's important that we document today because it could be a year, it could be two years from now uh, before they get to us, as we saw in the last crisis, you know, loans are being put back sometimes almost two years post uh, the application for guarantees. So we want to just make sure we've got that in place. And then with that, I'm going to have Dean uh, give some thoughts on what he's seeing from an accounting impact perspective, because certainly revenue recognition around what is substantial fee income for a lot of the uh, banks on this call that, that participated and jumped in feet first to help their borrowers and communities uh, is gonna be something that we, we need to address here in the second quarter. So Dean, you wanna take it from there? Sure, thanks, John. And um, yeah, you hit the nail right on it. The, the fee income has been the general, you know, the primary question that we've been getting with regard to the PPP program. And um, FASB addressed this in their April 8th meeting, at least acknowledging that there was a question regarding the fee income recognition, um, comparing whether to do a, a level yield recognition over the life of the loans or the estimated life of the loans uh, versus recognizing it all up front when received. Um, so they acknowledged the question, but how, somewhat have deferred that to a later time, and we've yet to get that guidance. 
So what most banks are doing are necessarily just defaulting to their normal accounting policies for loan fee origination. But I don't want to just exclusively talk about the fee uh, portion of it, but also the costs associated with the loan origination costs. So, um, you know, with, re with specific to the fees, most banks are um, really at this point, you know, waiting on the sidelines to see when they get the, the fee in, in cash to recognize it all up front. But the, um, there is a question with regard to the, the form that's required to be filed here, um, you know, 1502, I believe. And uh, as of at least Monday, I'm not sure that form was even available, the updated form that's now being required. And I believe you need to file that here. Um, I think the SBA is saying it's by the end of May. So the question with regard to have you even earned the fee if that, file, that form hasn't been filed yet remains to be seen. So I, I would say most banks at this point are, are generally on the sidelines waiting to at least getting approval with that form or, or when they have the cash in hand to start recognizing it over the life of the loans. Um, and until that FASB guidance comes out, I, I do think banks are, are, are going to be deferring, whether that be level yield or from a materiality standpoint, maybe default to you know, a straight line just to make it easy if the system necessarily, your, your core system, um, has some complications in doing it over level yield. Again, these are shorter term loans. Um, so if an analysis is done to, to figure out that materiality, um, just talk with your, your accounting team and also your auditors to make sure everyone's on the same page there. I mentioned the costs. Um, you know, generally banks have a standard menu of deferred costs that they recognize for different types of loans. Given the fact that these loans are a little bit different, especially for those non-SBA lenders prior to the PPP, um, you do want to take a look at that cost structure that you're using for your deferred period. Again, it is over a short period of time, so um, it may not be that impactful, but it's worth a, a second look to see the amount that you're going to be deferring for that time period. Uh, beyond fee recognition, I guess the other thing just to think about is with regard to the allowance. Again, for non-SBA lenders or prior to the PPP program, um, you probably didn't have a, a segment for SBA loans with any kind of guarantee. So you're going to want to think about that in your allowance calculation um, uh, going forward, at least for Q2 here through the remainder of the program. So thinking about the allowance and thinking about potential liability with that, Stan, I was going to kick it back over to you. Sure. Um, th thank you very much. Um, yeah, with, with mitigating liability under PPP, um, you've probably, everyone's probably seen in the news, there's been a whole bunch of lawsuits against banks re relating to PPP. Some of them uh, have been, you know, where lawsuits during the first round um, that um, lawsuits in the first round where banks weren't um, favoring bigger customers over smaller customers. Um, there were also loss, um, lawsuits in, uh, regarding agent fees. And, and, and I'd like to talk about agent's fees because the first set of lawsuits, I think those are quite frankly are sort of mute because there's plenty of money left in the second round of PPP funding. And I think the, the larger banks that were affected by those um, uh, lawsuits are um, probably taking steps to, you know, to ensure to limit their liability. But um, with respect to agent's fees, um, agent fees are interesting because the, the CARES Act in, in the PPP program allowed an agent of a borrower to obtain a certain percentage of a PPP loan. And they start at um, 5% um, up to $350,000. And then it's, it's, it scales down um, as the loan gets better, uh, as the loan gets bigger to um, a really low percentage. And, and the issue that we've seen with, with banks is that even though banks are, are getting uh, an, you know, an origination fee of 5%, they have to share, theoretically under this, they have to share with an agent and the agent would get you know, 1% 1, 1 or, or less depending on the size of the loan. And the issue is you have a lot of CPAs coming out of the woodwork, sometimes a month later, um, sending invoices to a bank asking for their agent fee. And, and the issue is it isn't quite clear. And unfortunately, the PPP program wasn't clearly drafted, but, but a, the PPP program follows a lot of prior SBA guidance. And one of those guidance measures is that if you're an agent originating loans, it's meant to be an agent of the lender, not necessarily the agent of the borrower. And with that, there is, of course, a bureaucratic requirement that the, that the lender have an agreement um, in the form of a, it's called an SBA Form 159, where the agent's acting on behalf of the lender, and, and that has to be in place before the lender um, 
can pay the agent fees. So um, we've seen a lot of that. We've also seen um, a, a lot of other banks that have taken a, a policy that in order to put money into the hands of their customers, given that there's a limited amount of funds that they've enacted policies that they will not um, uh, work with, you know, work with an agent because it will slow the, the process down. Um, and we've had, we've been dealing with uh, an FDIC complaint, which, you know, may or may not, uh, you know, yield anything and, you know, potential, uh, you know, liability on, on, on the bank on, on that part. And I think this is, this is an issue that a lot of the, the, um, the CPAs out there will be trying to, um, you know, lobby, you know, for a change in the law. But I think, quite frankly, the, sh you know, the ship has sailed since, since those funds are out there. And this is just an example of how um, the SBA, and, and well-meaning, of course, in order to, to get this program out, um, maybe omitted, you know, some, some key details. So we're monitoring yep. those agent fee lawsuits, and it will be interesting to see if, if they're able to get it any year. Yeah, and Stan, this is Rob. We've gotten a couple questions in, and, and maybe we can address those and then move off the CPP uh, program sure. now. Um, you know, one one thought is based on <clears throat> the new guidance that came out this morning of the two million dollar threshold. If a borrower um, had two point two or two point three million, what if they return? You know, the the, the part above the two hundred or the two million. And just return uh, my, that, my and then capture it. Oh, sorry, Rob. I apologize. Um, my opinion on that is, if the original disbursement was over two point three million, even if they return a portion to put it, them under the two million, I think the SBA is just going to look at the original amount dispersed. Right. Right. Um, and then another question of if if we think that there's a borrower who is. Uh, going into bankruptcy eventually, um, should they prevent or should they um, not accept the, uh, the loan application for that because of their, you know, their financial state going toward bankruptcy? Do you have any, again, all this is very factual and it's case by case. And I don't know if we want to be in a position where a bank would be making that decision anyway, but any quick thoughts on that? My, my quick my quick thought is that if the borrower meets the requirements of the application, the you know the bank ha, you know has to make a loan, um, make the PPP right. loan. If the borrower does eventually file for bankruptcy, um, there as long as the bank documented the loan properly, um, the bank should qualify for its its guarantee. I, again, PPP right. really no credit worthiness underwriting. It's more of a an, an application as long as the bank documents everything and did everything properly. Right. And the bank actually might be at more liability if it's a loan and that would be evidence of how it went into bankruptcy. It, 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 I well, would good. agree. Well, maybe, more yeah, maybe if we move on, I think maybe if we move on just in the interest of time to uh, the next slide, Michelle. Um, on regulatory and, and lending matters, and maybe kick it over to John Geringer and John Berenger to walk through some of what they're seeing from a regulatory point of view. Um, and if anyone has PPP questions, you know, populate them here, and we will have some time at the end. To answer them. Yeah. Thanks, Rob. This is John Berenger. So for those of you who look forward to the Berenger Geringer report, like I know certainly myself and Mr. Geringer do, this will hopefully. Uh, scratch that itch, as they say, uh, for the next couple of minutes as, as we work together here uh, in self-quarantine, though, in, in very uh, disparate home offices. So uh, with that, I'm going to turn over to my, uh, as I affectionately refer to him, my brother from another mother, Mr. Geringer, to talk a little bit about the regulatory response and what we're seeing out of the regulatory agencies right now. John? Thanks, John, and uh, looking forward to working with you and seeing all the audience again uh, live in person, hopefully soon. Uh, like uh, most of you on this webinar, uh, we've all lived through the last crisis and see some similarities and, and many differences. You know, the similarities are the, the notion of fear, uncertainty, and doubt that I know we're all feeling in different ways. But there are differences, right? We, um, the banking industry came into this uh, well-capitalized with stronger balance sheets.
even the regulators are experiencing uh, this crisis differently than the last one because they themselves are dealing with challenges surrounding telework and, and thinner staffing, um, which perhaps may engender more sympathy and, and maybe even empathy uh, in light of some of the things we're going for. I wouldn't take that too far. Uh, but really, uh, the response from the regulators, I, I think, has been in three in three stages. The, the first stage was really the pre-shutdown pandemic guidance and um, talk about uh, you know, setting up a plane as it's taking off. Uh, in a similar vein, the regulators started off by reminding everyone of pandemic guidance that was 10 years old uh, based on the last pandemic. And, and many banks, you know, along the lines of Warren Buffett's famous quote about figuring out who has their swimming suits when the tide goes out, I think many banks realized to what extent they had actually been doing pandemic planning um, as, as the lockdowns uh, gained momentum. And, you know, we have a client alert on that that boiled down some of these concepts. And, and you know, by now, I think we, we have all done a real life tabletop exercise with respect to these issues on, on risk assessments and having a pandemic plan. And it, I think in the, in the wave of PPP being behind us, it, it may make sense for bankers to revisit that and keep uh, ensuring that it's up to date and current and, and talk about lessons learned. And I think moving forward, have to think about staying informed. And, and we on our COVID-19 webpage are trying to boil down the regulatory guidance on this issue, uh, but also looking at the, uh, the government guidance on, on medical issues and as well as what each of the states are doing with respect to closures and sometimes even smaller communities, what they are doing on closures to, to stay ahead of, of really the, the type of information that you should be on top of. On top of that, thinking about things like reserves, supplies and equipment, uh, that you are uh, freshening up what you have and making sure your equipment is current, uh, how to deal with customers, uh, tightening up your third party agreements and revisiting those provisions dealing with uh, force majeure and other issues that may impact uh, your relations with your third party vendors. And then of course, any crisis is ripe for uh, malicious and fraudulent uh, actors out there. So being mindful and keeping reminding your staff of the type of things that uh, the malicious activities that FinCEN I know has put out in some of their recent guidance to be keeping an eye on. So that was really the first phase. The second phase was all the PPP guidance that Stan mentioned, as well as the accommodations that the regulators are allowing for banks to encourage them to provide these lending facilities uh, to get our economy back running. And you probably have seen the guidance relating to uh, capital conservation buffers, extensions on call reports, uh, a lot of things we thought we'd never see. Um, and I would be mindful of the fact that, you know, sometimes you can lose your muscle memory by um, uh, extending your call report deadlines, even if it's permitted. So I, I would be uh, careful to, as, as you're thinking about whether to uh, take advantage of some of these that anytime you see guidance with respect to regulators talking about easing uh, regulations or easing expectations, always in the next line they say, oh, oh but for, uh, you know, safety and soundness issues. So safety and soundness always has to be in the back of everyone's mind as they're doing these accommodations, uh, whether it be for borrowers uh, dipping into their capital conservation buffer, or uh, extending out call reports that eventually all those things are going to snap back to a more uh, normal activity range and and therefore you should be able to uh, make sure you could accommodate accordingly you know i think the next phase is really what we're going to see in examinations and we're starting to hear from our clients who've experienced these now virtual examinations that uh, it's a bit of be careful what you ask for you know for the last 20 years i've heard bankers say Boy, it'd be great if the examiners can do more things off-site. Uh, you know, we don't want so many bodies in our bank. And what I think the banks that we've worked with that have experienced these virtual exams have come to discover is, is that it really makes the exam process more challenging in a number of ways. Uh, they miss the human-to-human -human contact of being able to judge uh, how the regulators are thinking. Um, they are less able to address issues in real time. Uh, to the extent that they exist. 
And, and finally, it, it really is incumbent upon all the banks now that things are becoming so document heavy that more so than ever before, you know, your loan files have to tell the story uh, in and of themselves. And it really uh, shows how much all of you, as you experience these virtual exams, uh, will find out in the next few months, that it, it's really going to take a, a lot more and different type of attention being placed on how you're communicating with the regulators, any red flags that may occur along the way, and how you can address those in real time. Because as we all know, uh, exam issues, if left to fester, become harder and harder to uh, be able to get the regulators to change their mind. So that's uh, a general overview of what we're seeing uh, with respect to uh, regulatory exams and just the regulatory uh, posture on things. And with that, I'll turn over to RSM on the ALLL issue. Yeah, and thanks, John. This is John Berenger. You know, one other quick thing I just want to come back to because I think you hit on a great point uh, with the regulators is one thing we're working with clients with a fair amount is risk assessments. And, and I know we always talk about risk assessments are meant to be dynamic and living documents. And I think we, we all follow that. But since the last crisis, we've been able to, to operate in a relatively stable and steady industry environment. And now we're, we're facing a significant market disruption again. So I think, you know, what's important is to make sure that we go, uh, go back and look at those risk assessments and look to maybe adjust an update for COVID-19 and, and recognize that not all controls are created equally and certainly not just financial reporting controls, but also operating controls, to your point, John, in a safe and sound manner, operate differently outside the four walls of our branch or our, our building when we've got employees that are remote. So I think it's really critical to assess, you know, how has your control environment changed and what controls uh, and in which areas require more attention from a testing or just overall review process uh, as a result. So I, I, I appreciate your, your feedback and would echo also the comments on uh, exams. We're hearing the same thing anecdotally from clients as they go through it. And I think part of the challenge is not only are the regulators remote, but a lot, if not all of the exec team and, and other key members that would, are responding to exam questions are also remote, you know, and may not have access to stuff in their uh, desk drawer, so to speak, that's not necessarily in the loan file, it's in that, that drawer file. So uh, with that, Dean, do you want to share some thoughts on what we're seeing on the impact uh, from an allowance or for those publics that elected to move forward with CISO uh, in Q1 as uh, originally required, uh, what we're seeing there? Sure. Thanks, John. And as you mentioned, now we have the great divide with uh, regard to the allowance. We have some institutions with the traditional incurred allowance for loan loss model, and then we have some SEC filers um, uh, who are under the allowance for credit losses or, or you know, the CECL model. Um, and first, I'll, I'll speak a little bit about the incurred model. Um, and this has the remnants of going back a little bit back to our Great Recession back in 2008 in terms of um, a little bit of shell shock on, on what to do and, 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 and how to address this in, in the first quarter. And, Really, if you look at the FDIC FAQ that's out there, it, it almost alludes to the fact that, you know, institutions needed some time to truly address the impact from COVID-19 um, with most organizations, you know, especially in the, the Great Lakes area here in, in Chicago, Chicagoland area, really not seeing any kind of detriment in the asset quality in terms of past due loans. And I say that with, you know, generality. I know there's individual cases to evaluate. But, you know, with that, you know, most banks took a look at their portfolio evaluated any businesses that they think, you know, would be deemed essential businesses and, and directly impacted by, by the stay-at-home orders and whatnot, or, or strongly tied to those essential businesses. Um, but with that, you know, whether they're, you know, carving those out and evaluating those separately, most organizations did take a look at their qualitative factors and pointed to economic factor data that was available, uh, specifically economic uh, and unemployment data, especially at the tail end of March, to, to make adjustments uh, from a qualitative factor. And, you know, those could range somewhat differently, you know, different organizations to different things. Um, but it, some increase was generally taken by most organizations, despite the, the FDIC's guidance of maybe, you know, taking time to evaluate things. And I do think it was prudent in the idea that we did have economic data that pointed to underlying problems growing in the portfolio. So whether that was a, you know, 10 to 20 basis point adjustment 
Um, most banks did make that adjustment, increased their allowance, and did that under the incurred model. So speaking about CECL here, you know, as you mentioned, some banks did have the option to defer uh, from the CARES Act guidance, and I think approximately 35 to 40 banks, at least that I know of as of uh, a Bloomberg search that I ran, um, across the U.S. did defer the adoption of CECL, although, albeit they were accelerated filers um, uh, that were set to, to adopt on January 1st. So for those that did adopt, um, there was obviously the impact on January 1st for adoption. Most of those uh, organizations did disclose in their, their previous financial statements and in their footnotes to, you know, the estimated range of impact or, or even a dollar amount of impact from that January 1st adoption um, effect. And then when we looked at Q1 and, and really thinking about COVID, you know, the guidance came out that COVID really was a Q1 or, you know, a, a March 31 provision um, item and event. So, you know, most banks, I should say all banks took a, you know, a decently large provision in Q1 here. Uh, some different than other in the, in the range, I guess, depends, right? You had the mega banks that almost wiped out or did wipe out Q1 earnings altogether. Uh, and then perhaps a somewhat of more muted approach um, with, you know, smaller community banks. But again, the allowance provision was significant in the first quarter for, for all banks adopting CECL. And, and really the, the impact of the, the reason for the difference of uh, uh, provisions really comes from the impact of a, a few items, right? Um, the metrics that are used in that forecast factor in that CECL calculation can, can drive things um, in a different way, in a different manner for different banks. Uh, likewise, the sources for those for forecast metrics will be different by bank to bank. Um, and how quickly that source necessarily is refreshed and, and how recent that um, forecast was available as of the reporting date did have played an impact into what was recorded uh, in, in the first quarter provision. Likewise, affecting the, the CECL provision also was the, you know, assumptions around the reversion period of, re, you know, reversion, reverting back from the forecast to the historical norms adjusted for qualitative factors. Um, a lot of banks did take a look at that reversion period and shorten it up given the volatility in the market and with COVID and, and all the different government uh, programs going on. Um, likewise, with all the effects of some of these um, metrics and, and whatnot, there's also the, the, the government programs lo looking to offset some of that. So, our organizations did, and our, our financial institutions that did adopt CECL did take a look at both the, the detriment but also the positives, you know, all, again, I'm somewhat muted and not going to necessarily counteract entirely, but did play a fact in terms of estimating that qualitative adjustment to the, uh, to the CECL provision. Uh, and thinking about all, all this, the, the forecast factors and the qualitative factors, the manner in which the application occurred in the models also varied from clients and is allowed in the guidance, right? Whether that be embedded in the cash flow expectations or qualitatively layered on. Um, so all those did play, play an impact in the CECL models uh, for the first quarter. Uh, and, and again, it's hard to compare bank to bank because different things like, you know, existing acquired loans, uh, different structure of portfolio, um, but again, across the board, we saw large provisions taken in the first quarter. So those are the things to be thinking about um, as you as you private organizations who aren't subject to CESL, but thinking about models, you know, looking out into the future into 2023 when you do adopt it, it's interesting to think about that now and 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 planning the impact for later when, when adopting. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about loan modifications. I do want to just briefly mention the, the accounting aspects of, of it um, before we get into the structuring here. Um, you know, there was that interagency guidance that came out in March unprecedented, on an unprecedented matter on, on a Sunday, uh, which was later updated in, in April. And then there's the CARES Act that gave even broader reach in terms of modifying loans and taking away the, um, the negative aspects of TDR accounting and avoiding non-performing status and maintaining interest income recognition. So um, all that does call, call, cause somewhat of an awkward accounting as it relates to revenue recognition and, and the nuts and bolts of the accounting. I know the FASB did issue some guidance for a specific scenario of a payment holiday uh, that's out there and available uh, in terms of two options with re regard to either delaying recognition or, or recasting the effective yield uh, over the, the new term of the loans. Um, what I want to just mention here briefly before we kick it over to, to Stan about structuring is the idea that the accounting will follow the structure that you do put in place for your modification. So time is, is necessary to you know, evaluate the different structures that you put in place to think about the, uh, the modification accounting. But again, you do have the benefits of not having to call loans uh, uh, past due or TDRs, and, and, and you get to maintain that interest accrual, assuming that it is related to a COVID um, relief modification uh, and the, the customer was current uh, 
at the beginning of the year. Uh, the key thing really there is to keep track of your COVID modifications for future disclosures, whether it be in the call report in Q2 or down the road with your annual financial statements, and then considering the impacts to the actual allowance calculation, uh, whether it be CECL or incurred model. Um, the guidance came out from the webcast, I guess, a couple weeks ago. It did, you know, regulators did provide broad discretion in terms of how you do modify um, but keeping that in mind, you do need to think about the impact of the allowance. And again, although it's not an impaired loan or a loan that is a TDR per se, um, I think qualitatively you need to think about the, the volume of modification in that allowance calculation. So with that, Sam, I want to kick it over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Dean. Um, yeah, as the crisis first unflo um, unfolded, certainly the message from the regulators was to essentially give, give borrowers a break. And we saw a lot of banks uh, pretty much do blanket loan deferrals and modifications uh, for a short period of time, usually about 90 days. Now, as, as those initial uh, deferrals and modifications are going to expire, you know, come, come June, uh, we think it's important for banks um, not to kick the can down the road and do another set of blanket loan modifications or deferrals, but really to look at their loans each individually because you're going to have you know, some borrowers that unfortunately will, will not make it back from this crisis. You'll have on the other end of the spectrum, you'll have other borrowers that will, may have had some minimal interruption, but will, will make it back. And you have, have a bunch in the big vast middle. And really each of those different buckets really um, requires a, a, a different approach for, you know, for the bank, um, you know, to preserve its collateral and, 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 and whatnot. Um, and with and with that, I'd like to um, go back to John Berenger and get some other comments about uh, some of that research. Yeah, thanks, Dan. And so I think just a couple of other thoughts uh, as we wrap up the discussion on the, the loan mods and forbearances. I think, as everyone's alluded to, documentation is, is key for this. We saw that during the last crisis. I think the other thing, you know, a couple other points we're focused on is you know, let's monitor as we come out of this borrower performance, certainly, and with a key to certain industries that we know have been more impacted than others, hospitality uh, certainly being uh, near, if not the top of the list. Um, the other thing is we really get one bite of the apple here. So with that, I would, you know, we're encouraging our clients not to overreach, meaning if the borrower was having problems before, uh, even if they were current, but you knew there were issues, um, I would say it's important to consider and document uh, on those in particular why it then wasn't a TDR. But again, you get one bite of the apple. So think about the structure you put in place um, and, and manage it uh, accordingly based on what you think that borrower can actually do based on what their uh, cash flow forecasts look going forward, look like going forward in the kind of new normal. Uh, you know, based on what the impact has been and, and the long-term impact is on their demand. Uh, so with that, John Geringer, you want to jump in on any other compliance issue, issues uh, banks need to be thinking about? Sure, absolutely. And since we can't get away from PPP, uh, we've summarized a couple points in some of our client alerts recently about the fair lending implications related to PPP and making sure you have consistent documentation and transparency with your customers about who you will and will not uh, take with, on that issue. Uh, but beyond PPP, uh, banking still goes on and I'm working right now on three BSA related enforcement actions. And so um, I think it's pretty clear that banks who are trying to uh, gain additional income these days, uh, whether it be uh, any type of higher risk customers. It could be MSBs, money service businesses. It could be MRBs, uh, cannabis related businesses, marijuana related businesses, and um, even things like international ACH. Any Anytime banks engage in some of these uh, riskier types of activities, not that there's anything wrong with them, but it's making sure you have the right BSA compliance infrastructure to manage it. And uh, there's no issue now that I've done more training with boards of directors on, more dealing with enforcement actions about than BSA. And um, so I think these days, once you're uh, done thinking about PPP, uh, BSA should, should never be far behind in your next, next BSA exam, particularly if you're engaged in um, some of those activities. Um, let me switch to stress testing a bit. 
we talked to our clients about this uh, quite a lot over the years. And um, you know, I think it's fair to say that any stress testing you did before February is probably pretty stale these days. And uh, like John B talks about is making it dynamic, thinking about your portfolio. You know, what are the particular kinds of industries that are hit by the pandemic that could be problematic for your portfolio? What sorts of concentrations, whether it be retail, CRE, restaurants, et cetera, that we know are gonna be hard hit even if the economy opens up soon. And so rethinking how you consider stress testing, and we'll talk about how that flows into capital later, I, I think is something that banks need to revisit almost in real time. And John B., from your perspective? Yeah, thanks, John. Uh, so really, in, in talking with clients, we've been focused on five industries, uh, as I alluded to. And so I think where, I, you know, where we're focused is industrial consumer products, particularly clients with exposure to the international supply chain, whether it's for uh, materials or to sell finished goods, uh, and the impact near-term and long-term on demand again uh, as we look at stress testing and the impact on revenues. Um, certainly hospitality with a focus on hotels, so whether you consider that hospitality or CRE, I guess it, it depends on your setup of your, your stress test uh, model, but certainly something to look at. Energy, obviously, is one that's been a focus. Uh, retail, again, I think goes without saying. And then lastly, and this is more with a lens to the long term, is commercial real estate. While we recognize near-term uh, shocks from maybe some rent deferrals or, or uh, tenants who can't make payments, I think the longer-term question is, how is behavior modified in this new way to work post-COVID look? And likely, you know, we've seen many, many different uh, articles, including TREP, who's a leader in the uh, CMBS space, talk about the fact that demand is likely going to be soft uh, going forward as we uh, adjust to this new way to work, uh, which involves a lot more remote uh, work uh, rather than folks gathering together in offices like we've seen really um, for the last few really generations. Um, so with that, uh, we're going to move on to capital. So Michelle, if you can be kind enough to move the slide forward, and we're going to kick it over to Mr. Fleetwood and to John Precheck to talk about some capital matters, uh, as well as an uh, M&A on the next slide. So with that, Rob, the floor is Great. yours. <clears throat> Great. Thanks, John. Um, and we'll get uh, Precheck uh, talking in a moment here. Um, one thing that's kept a lot of uh, my time busy over the past couple of weeks has been uh, dealing with our public clients on uh, subordinated debt. So the market seems to be open. Um, there are uh, plenty of institutional investors and other investors who want to lock in a rate that seems to be, and I'll let John speak to this, but somewhere between five and 6%. Um, and I think some of the keys for both the public clients on this call as well as the privates, but you need to be in a position where you can act quickly um, because I think, you know, the market, the windows are opening and closing. So for a public company, from a legal perspective, you know, you want to make sure that you have um, either S3 eligibility or you've got an active shelf um, and that you're able to use that. Um, and you need to make sure that you're communicating with your accounting staff um, and, and outside accountants to make sure that you can go through the comfort letter process as quickly as possible. Um, you know, otherwise, it's just coordinating, um, working with your investment banker to, to make sure you bring yourself to, to market. Um, maybe I'll uh, kick it over to John Freecheck for a minute. You know, John, what are you seeing? What are your thoughts? You know, we have a bullet here of is it you know, do they need it or is it contingency? Kind of what are you hearing from uh, the clients, both public and private that you're talking to? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Rob. And, and this is John Freecheck at Piper Sandler. I'll kind of give you the, um, the investment banker perspective on this. And it has been interesting, as you would imagine, over the last two months, as you alluded to with our clients, both public and private, um, the conversations have shifted very quickly to capital creation and capital preservation discussions. Uh, which is quite different um, from what we were talking about back in just February. 
And the good news is that a number of our clients uh, and, and most of the bank universe is starting from a position of strength here. You've heard a lot about how banks are better capitalized than they were heading into the financial crisis back in 2008, 2009. And that's absolutely true. Uh, you know, uh, uh, you know Behringer and Geringer touched upon stress testing a moment ago, and we've been looking at some of that with clients as well. And for the most part, a number of banks, uh, you know, looking at that, uh, and again, always dangerous to look at historical precedent to predict the future, but they're starting from a strong capital position. And much of it is a little bit defensive, where it doesn't hurt to, to, to build up the castle walls a little bit higher. But also, to your point, uh, hopefully to be in a position of offense down the road here and build that war chest a little bit uh, in a time when the window is open. And, and that's a critical point you made a moment ago, Rob, where right now the window for preferred stock and subordinated debt is back open. And we're starting to see a bit of a scramble to squeeze through it, where, you know, just psychologically, seeing that window close briefly for the first time in a number of years, back when the economy was grinding to a halt back in early January, has served as a very powerful reminder for our clients that capital markets aren't necessarily always going to be open to you when you need them. And so we're seeing a lot of activity in that space right now. And I'll start on the preferred side, where here in Chicago, uh, last week you saw Wintrust execute a $250 million preferred issuance at six and seven eighths. Uh, we uh, at Piper Sandler helped uh, Ocean First, a $10 billion bank client out in New Jersey, uh, issue 55 million in preferred stock at 7% to give you a sense of where those rates are coming in. And so there is an avenue to tier one capital right now if you feel that you either need or want to build your tier one position. Now, the Ocean First deal that I just alluded to was on the heels of a $125 million subdebt issuance that they also performed that was at five and a quarter percent. Now, this is an area where Piper Sandler, we are very active right now and historically. Uh, just to give you a sense, you know, at Piper Sandler, we've done more uh, community bank subdebt deals than all of our competitors combined over the last five years. And the good news is that we are busy right now. And there are nuances, of course, uh, you know, Rob, you touched upon, you know, that we're seeing both public deals and private placements an investment grade rating from an agency such as Kroll or the others, uh, you know, Moody's, Fitch, S&P certainly helps matters, but we're seeing investors come back at all levels here. And that's insurance companies, money managers, as well as community banks. Now, not all investors in this space have come back to the table, but we're seeing a number of these transactions where an investor says, we're on the sidelines, we're on the sidelines, and then all of a sudden, a day before we're gonna price the transaction, we get an order from them. So we're seeing these investors come back to the table, and that's good news for our bank clients. And where that really shows up is in pricing. And pricing, which is, is fairly hard to believe, if you think about everything we've been through over the last two months, the pricing we're seeing on these subordinated debt issuances is not out of line with what we have seen over the past couple of years. And as you touched upon, Rob, that's in that five to 6% range. Now, you look back and in February, we led two transactions for Fulton uh, in Pennsylvania, which was a $200 million deal, and First Citizens in North Carolina, which was a $350 million deal. Those were both priced between three and a quarter and three and a half percent. That was a bit of a mirage. That was the, the right bank at the absolute perfect time. And you know, if, think of those as a mirage, really. We're not gonna see sub three and a half percent anytime soon, but five to 6% on a pre-tax basis for tier two capital that you can push down to the bank as tier one is pretty darn attractive right now. And so again, that's in line with what we saw back if we were sitting here in May 20 of 19 would be five to 6% generally for community banks. And so this market is back open. Now, again, as, as you would suspect, credit is critical, where if you have a concentration in energy, you've been doing a lot of lending in the Bakken, that's going to be an issue, obviously. Uh, but, you know, uh, if you have, you know, your house is in order and you don't have a, a concentration in a very 
high at risk industries such as such as energy, hotels, something of that nature, this market is open and we're seeing a number of our clients look to take advantage. And now yeah, I, I talked and, earlier and on that on that point and to play off on what Behringer said earlier about the stress testing, you know, from and we've got a bullet here on disclosure issues. You know, the disclosure issues are basically how much detail can you give an investor? And this would be whether you're doing a private or a public offering. You know, how much good data can you give them on these at risk, you know, the, the COVID at risk uh, uh, businesses? So, hospitality, restaurants, energy, um, all of that stuff is something that I know public companies with their earnings releases put out. Most put out pretty good decks um, with breakdowns on that, and that's being digested. And for private companies, if you want to do anything that's beyond just around the board table um, kind of offering or raise, you're going to need to consider how you can break that portfolio down and 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 show people what it what it um, what it looks like and how much exposure you might have in some of these more uh, at-risk uh, industries. Yeah, a absolutely, Rob. And, uh, you know, that, that's spot on. You can look to some of these uh, publicly uh, available documents that uh, uh, came out with the Q1 earnings and see the level of, of detail that really is required to get investors comfortable with these transactions from a credit perspective. Um, and then and turning quickly to, to stock repurchases, you know, I'll just touch on the, the public side of it. We talked earlier about you know, capital preservation, and we have seen, obviously, the largest banks made headlines when they uh, uniformly shut down their stock repurchase programs. And we have seen a number of public institutions uh, uh, put their stock repurchase programs on hiatus. Not all, but, but a number of them have. And maybe, Rob, you can touch a little bit on what you're seeing in the uh, privately uh, held bank space in terms of stock repurchase activity. Yeah, um, I agree with you on the public end of things. We've got a lot of phone calls over the past couple of weeks of um, investors who have gone to the, the private banks and asking for a liquidity event and seeing if the bank would be interested in repurchasing. Um, and you've got to be careful. Um, it's not that you can't do it. Um, it's just a question of how are you going to price it and how are you going to protect Number one, is this in the best interest of your shareholders to use your capital in this, in this way? Um, and two, is the price that you're paying, you know, how, how are you justifying it and is it fair? So um, those are, are discussions that we've been having. It's, it's kind of a you know, facts and circumstances type uh, issue depending on how many shares and, and, and that type of thing. But we are seeing a lot of activity of private investors or, or uh, uh, private banks having their investors come and seeing if they can uh, repurchase some shares and maybe kick it to Garinger for a minute and remind everyone on this phone, the 094 uh, 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 issue that was put out back in the crisis from the Federal Reserve about what you need to consider on both stock repurchases and dividends. Thanks, Rob. And that, that guidance primarily uh, was targeted toward institutions that were in some degree of trouble, but really what it's turned into is a bit of a blueprint for how any bank holding companies and even concepts that should be adopted at the bank level should be followed when you consider things like dividends, stock redemption, stock repurchases. Uh, before I get into those factors, one thing I will say is depending on which reserve bank you talk to, there's different levels of consultation that they ask for. Uh, we've been so frustrated by this, hearing our clients' frustration, that we even took it all the way to the, uh, the head ombudsman at the Federal Reserve to try to help us smooth out a consistent um, approach by all the Federal Reserve banks and sometimes inconsistency within reserve banks. So the bottom line is this is some level of consultation is probably a good idea when you're considering doing these things. Uh, it's not always a formal regulatory approval, but sometimes it's just a good excuse to touch base uh, with the Fed or if you're doing it at the bank level with your bank regulators. But really what the 094 guidance talks about is looking at nine factors before you make any decisions as to whether or not you do dividends, re redemptions or repurchases, and if so, how much. And it really looks at the totality of the circumstances, all the sorts of things that you would probably 
consider anyway, which are, you know, what's your organization's asset quality with potential declines in asset values. And I think that's going to be more important now than it has been in maybe the last seven years or so. Uh, perspective earnings, same thing, liquidity, uh, other risks that may affect the institution that aren't reflected in the balance sheet. And that's, you know, clearly what we're seeing in this COVID situation, uh, level composition and quality of your capital and your ability. And this goes back to uh, what uh, John Princhak talked about, you know, your ability to raise additional capital in the prevailing market and economic conditions. So really taking all those things, evaluating it, making sure your board memorializing it in uh, your board minutes so you have a good record of what you're doing. And th that serves many purposes. That serves your fiduciary duties. That serves uh, with uh, regard to transparency with the regulators. And it's a good discipline to have when you're doing these things. Rob? Yeah, thanks, John. Um, let's move to the next slide if we can, uh, M&A activity. Um, there's been some, uh, you know, some of, legacy, of the legacy deals that were in place before the crisis uh, hit are still moving forward. Some aren't. Um, I'm going to push it back to uh, Precheck to give kind of his impression of the current M&A market. Obviously, we're not going to hit the, the numbers that we were hoping to hit or that we thought we would hit at the beginning of the year. But, John, just your thoughts on... Um, Kind of the M&A environment right now and if we're back in 2021 or whatever. Uh, I don't know if any of us uh, uh, know exactly. No, good, good, great question, Rob. And, and if you can predict 2021, I'm going to Vegas with you as soon as we get off this webinar. Um, it, it's, that it's a would, great that question. That would be dangerous. Yeah, <laughs> amen. Uh, but, you know, this is, again, a very different conversation than we would have had just a couple months ago. We're, in effect, in a pandemic pause here. Um, you know, we keep getting asked that exact question. When do you think the market's going to open up again on, on the M&A side? And we're essentially in a rolling 60-day hiatus right now um, you, because you, you just don't know. I mean, every, everything is happening uh, so quickly. And again, you know, as, as was touched upon earlier in the call, uh, you know, when the regulators and the government and the Fed, everybody's kind of making this up as, as they go along. That's a very difficult, uh, nearly impossible environment to effectively uh, enact a, an acquisition. And so you touched upon previously announced deals. So these were deals where a definitive agreement is signed, it's out in the open, and we've even seen a couple of those you know, run into issues in this environment to give you a sense of the difficulty of getting these deals done right now. Um, you know, uh, a few days ago, you saw a credit union uh, that was set to acquire a bank in Florida terminate their deal uh, and some very unusual statements in uh, proxies going out to shareholders where we saw a transaction where in the first paragraph, of the proxy, um, it stated in, in black and white that if the buyer's volume weighted average stock price doesn't get back above the bottom end of a collar range that was set in that transaction, the buyer is going to trigger their right to terminate the deal. That's a big eye opener for those selling shareholders. And it gives you a sense of the challenge that we face right now. And so in effect, you know, that, that in M and a is, is on a bit of a hiatus for the time being, because imagine trying to go perform credit due diligence on another bank at the moment. Uh, everybody in the industry is, is drinking from a fire hose dealing with their own reality. And so the, the idea of trying to go and get your arms around another bank's credit portfolio is, is a daunting task at the moment. And so until that has a little bit more clarity, that's gonna be the, that's gonna be the reality of, of the M&A environment. And so one, one other point I wanna make though, is that when this does start to open back up and we can get our arms around credit a little bit better, bank EPS estimates across the board have been slashed, call it 25 to 30% for both 2020 and 2021. A driving factor in M&A going forward, you're going to see is cost savings. And we saw this in some of the mergers of equals, if you will, that we saw before the pandemic. And if EPS is down 25 to 30% across the board for the next couple of years and cost savings haven't really changed, the impact of those cost savings has only been magnified and in some situations has made a merger that much more compelling once we can actually get back into 
an environment where you can perform an M&A transaction. So that's one thing to keep an eye on. Last point I'll make is that, you know, how can your bank position itself to go back on offense when the skies do clear back up? And there are a couple of check the box items you can take care of. Uh, I hope we don't see an environment where we have uh, a number of failed banks again, but getting back on the FDIC's call list for those. We've only seen one deal this year in West Virginia. We talked about building capital, but again, just continuing to talk with potential merger partners, that courtship idea, and even just you know, having a good dialogue with banks in your general community and footprint about you know, how are they doing? How are they grappling with this pandemic? Can be a nice way to build a rapport with them if you don't already have one and just see how that bank operates and get a sense for, for how they're getting through this environment. So continue to have that dialogue, I think can be a powerful thing once the markets do open back up. And uh, with that, uh, I'll pass it back over uh, to uh, Dean, if you wanna to touch upon uh, valuation uh, b before we move on. Yeah, thanks, John. And I'll be brief here. I just wanna to touch on a couple items as it relates to the environment that we're in. And I know that our valuation partner at RSM, Suzanne Mara, is probably jumping at the bit to jump on the webcast, but we just didn't have enough slot. Um, but I will touch on this, right? So I've given the environment that we're in, uh, we are think seeing uh, the idea that prices are going down, implied, implied multiples are being affected by the environment that we're in. Likewise, you know, I want to remind folks of the purchase accounting uh, rules and, and the impact here as it relates to both valuation, uh, but also the, the dichotomy between, you know, uh, CECL versus incurred model and the impact on purchase accounting. And we'll go through the nuts and bolts of that, but uh, the difference between a purchase credit deteriorated loan versus, versus a uh, purchase credit impaired loan, depending on what model you're running under, uh, it will have impacts to that. And an interesting, I guess, anecdote to think about here is with regards to, um, you know, a, a seller that has COVID models and in, in the, excuse me, COVID modifications and how those will be treated through purchase accounting and, and how that compares to how you're treating your COVID modifications as a, as a buyer. I do think there's a, there's something to be considered there in, in terms of documentation and evaluating those purchase accounting considerations. Um, real brief as it relates to Goodwill, I'm, I'm just gonna touch base, you know, for those of you that have Goodwill recorded already, uh, thinking about the environment that we're in in Q1 and, and, re, and the need for reevaluating that, whether you did that already or, or continuing to monitor that here in Q2 and, and thereafter as we're still in, in unprecedented times. Um, but also the challenges that, you know, Goodwill has in, in terms of evaluating that in a purchase accounting situation and the impact of Goodwill and any, you know, pro forma scenarios that you're running through. So um, all things to be thinking about and, and the impact of the uh, environment that we're in. Um, but again, with, with the low interest rate environment that we're in, and uh, there will be definitely a downward trend in, in the valuation uh, that we're seeing. So, so with that, I guess Rob was going to kick it up to you to, to move forward with the next topic. Yeah, I think uh, moving along, let's uh, change pace a little bit and talk um, about uh, employment matters, which uh, all of us uh, touch um, and introduce uh, Lynn Mapes Reardon and John Berenger. I think it's going to have some points as well on, you know, what do we do? How do we bring people back when our different states are allowing uh, that to happen. So, Lynn, over to you. John, did you want to make a few preliminary comments? Um, you know what, in the interest of time, Lynn, why don't you go ahead and jump in? I think everybody's interested in, in, in really focus on these issues. So you go ahead, I can loop my discussion into our closing, Rob, so thanks. Very good, very good. Well, what I would like to start with is the fact that we're starting to see the first cases brought against employers. Um, very unfortunately for the death or injury of an employee, where they're claiming that the employee caught COVID-19 in the workplace. So to increase potential recovery, what the plaintiffs are doing are trying to take the claim out of what we know to be the exclusive and limited remedies of the workers' compensation schemes. So workers' compensation system is a balance of interests where employees receive certainty that they'll get wage and medical benefits if they're injured in the workplace. And what employers get in return is immunity from lawsuits because those lawsuits could result in much greater damages and some of which could even be existential for an employer. So this is a balance that was struck many, many years ago. But it doesn't mean that an employee can't take certain claims out of 
or workplace injury or death out of the workers' compensation system. But to do so, at least in Illinois, the employee will have to show that the injury was not accidental, but was intentional. So to mitigate any claims that the employer intended to injure an employee by bringing him or her back to work before the end of the pandemic, the employer should take steps recommended by the governmental public health officials. So here, I would refer, refer you to the CDC and the Department of Labor, Labor OSHA guidelines for those steps. So you'll also want to refer to any state governmental guidelines because those will be um, also applicable here. The hyper-local guidelines, maybe not so much, but you do pay attention to those. What those guidelines will require you to do, among other things, is adopt certain policies and procedures, primarily focused on the cleaning of the workplace, social distancing practices unique to that workplace, and personal protective equipment, all tailored to your particular workplaces and even work environments within the workplaces. So another um, aspect in which we think about mitigating risk during this time is to remember that all of the non-discrimination laws that existed before the pandemic continue to be enforced just with new fact situations. Most applicable to the pandemic situation is our need to remember that we have to comply with the Americans with Disabilities Act and other non-discrimination laws as you implement your partial or full return to work. Clients are asking how they can decide who is first to be required to return. Can the employer be compassionate and require employees who are in the known risk categories to stay home out of concern for the employee? The answer is no. Um, but this is where communication with the employee is critical because the employee may and certainly does share those concerns. Where an employee has an underlying disability that puts the employee at greater risk in the event of exposure, the employer must discuss, discuss possible accommodations with that employee. That could include continuing a work from home arrangement or additional leave or other ideas. The most important part there is the communication that goes on between the employer and the employee. But if the employee does not have an underlying disability, then you're not required to provide an accommodation. And that's where you can have difficult conversations about, well, the need to come home or come home, <laughs> not stay at home, but rather come into the workplace. We have to remember that um, we cannot fail to bring back employees because some of these employees and many of these organizations are not being paid and therefore they'd like to get come back. We can, cannot fail to bring them back, however well intentioned, when we know they're in other high risk groups, such as older employees and pregnant employees. So how do we decide who to bring back and when? Start with your operational needs. What are those? You need certain employees in certain functions and you don't need others right away. Make neutral decisions. Don't take into account as much as you're inclined to try to be protective, make neutral decisions and then document the criteria used to make those decisions. So let's talk about a particular aspect of compliance. And this is we're starting to see cases brought against employers for failure to comply with leave laws, including the new Family First Coronavirus Response Act, where it has the paid family leave and paid sick leave. If you're uncertain whether you have to provide these benefits or whether someone qualifies, you really need to seek appropriate guidance. And also remember that although not a risk mitigation effort, that if you're providing these benefits, you need employees to provide substantiation for the leave so you can uh, claim the tax credits. <laughs> Maybe that is mitigation um, to be able to get the tax credits. But a final note on mitigating risk with the leave laws is to remember that each of the non-discrimination and leave laws includes the prohibition against retaliation for employees who seek or have received those benefits. The fact that they 
receive those benefits or they sought them should never enter into any employment decisions that you make with respect to them. And then finally, don't create additional risk when you communicate your return to work decisions. As you communicate the return to work, you should describe the steps that you're taking to create a safe and healthy workplace, including the policies and procedures mentioned earlier. Employees will naturally be concerned what it is you're doing. But do not make any assurances that the workplace is safe. Simply emphasize the steps that you have taken to help make it safe. And then all this may be moot if Congress grants immunity to businesses for bringing back employees. You may have heard of such efforts. While it is foolhardy to try to predict what Congress um, might agree upon, I do expect that if Congress grants immunity, that it will come with conditions. One piece of legislation introduced by Representative Mike Turner out of Ohio um, does just that. Under his employer and employee COVID Protection Act, employers would have immunity from employee claims only if it complies with all the state and federal laws related to workplace safety. That brings us full circle to the first discussion on how to mitigate the risk of a claim outside of workers' compensation. So with these steps and considerations in mind, you should be fairly well situated to mitigate your risks of employee litigation. And that really ends my prepared comments. I suspect we want to postpone any questions um, in the interest of time here. Yeah, Lynn, why don't we, we've got, you know, <clears throat> six minutes left and I'm, I'm sure we can stay on after if there are questions, um, but maybe we uh, move on a bit just to finish through the deck and, and uh, have some final remarks. Um, the next slide on corporate governance and for the listeners out there, there's a reason why corporate governance slides are always put toward the end because when we need to adjust for timing, it's the easiest thing to, uh, to, to, breeze over quickly, particularly with um, people who are who are on this call. So obviously speaking, I, I guess my two points, and I'll turn it over to Behringer, are just make sure that you're using your board's expertise um, and experience. Don't ignore the board. They all have businesses as well, um, or had businesses, and can give valuable insight. So make sure that you're tapping them for information and advice on how do we bring people back? You know, what are you seeing out in the market and all that? And I think that the stronger boards and the boards that communicate the best are gonna be uh, very, very helpful for a company to, to get through this. The other thing is just make sure that you are building a record of communication with them where you're giving them updates and that you're documenting it in minutes and notes. There's two uh, groups that you want to make sure that you are satisfying here. The first is shareholders to make sure that if something happens that you can show your shareholders that the board was actively involved and, and did what they needed to do. And the other is regulators. And we all learned, you know, 12 years ago that the regulators, you know, if there is a, a banking issue uh, down the road or, or bank health issue, that um, they're going to look at what the board did. So. Just make sure that you're doing the, the smart, practical things of documenting what you're doing. Um, you know, I'll turn it over for, to, to John or Dean if you have any final thoughts on that, then we can flip to the conclusion and open up for questions. Yeah, no, thanks, Rob. I think just around uh, audit committee considerations, you know, again, I think it's providing that effective challenge particularly, as I mentioned earlier, around the control environment and potential changes and, and that impact you, whether it's your operational controls, including compliance and DSA, whether it's um, the impact COVID had on financial reporting for fiduciary stocks, and then certainly how external audit is considering that as well in their program is key. And I think the board being engaged, whether or not they're on the audit committee and, and providing that oversight is critical. Um, with that, if we can go to the last slide, Michelle, please. Um, I'm going to just jump in real quick on economic impact here. And so our economic team at RSM has been uh, all over this from, from the start. And Joe Persuelis and his team have done a great job. If you haven't already, I'd encourage you to 
to go out to our Real Economy blog posts. They're getting updated a couple of times a day and really covering the gamut. Some uh, specifically targeted to financial institutions, some taking and, and leveraging our broader perspective on the middle market economy here in the U.S., given our exposure to, to various industries through our different practices uh, that make up you know, the customers for, for our clients, our bank clients. Um, and so with that, really what we're anticipating is more of a Nike swoosh recovery. And, and Joe and his team had kind of uh, identified that early on in the process as opposed to the, the V that I think many were hoping for early on. And, and the reason Joe and his team concluded that is really this recovery is going to be disparate by industry. You know, you've heard us talk throughout this 90 minutes and you're seeing it in your, your loan portfolio, each industry is, is responding differently, is being impacted differently. Some will see that demand come back as soon as we see a return to kind of a little more normal um, or whatever the new normal looks like. Others, you know, again, hospitality travel being one of those where it's likely, uh, you know, some geographies may see that demand come back very, very slowly. Some may see it altered kind of permanently based on changes in consumer behavior. So I think that are, those are really the challenges. So what I would, you know, what we're seeing from our clients and what we're focused on is, as John Freecheck alluded to, is really those cost structure reductions that we can do through the acceleration of technology are going to be very meaningful on two fronts. One, it's going to make us more competitive from a cost perspective, but two, it's going to help us adapt to both our customer demand of how they want to interact and also accommodating our employees and kind of workforce changes. So we also see branch optimization, really digital transformation continuing to move to the forefront. And it's really an opportunity for community banks, I think, to grab market share in what has, uh, in a, a market disruption that has left a little uh, egg on the face of some of the, me on some of the mega banks and really brought to light the challenges of their inability to be agile to, to borrower needs despite their size and, and vast resources. Um, so with that, uh, Rob, you want to touch on oncoming litigation? Well, I, it's, it's anyone's guess. I think we and cut this a little bit short too to open up the question. Um, I just, I, I know from being an attorney and, and, um, looking at other attorneys and people who aren't in traditional business law firms, there's going to be a pressure for plaintiff's attorneys to start chasing what they can. And I think we're going to see, as, as Stan alluded to um, earlier in the call, I think we're going to see a lot of creative uh, lawsuits coming out of this. So I just think we need to make sure that Again, we're making uh, a careful decisions and realizing that there's going to be some frivolous lawsuits and we can't get um, too uh, freaked out about that, but we you know, need to start making decisions as well that uh, reflect that. So I don't have any crystal ball of where that's going to come. I'll leave it to my uh, creative plaintiff uh, bar on <laughs> what's going to happen, uh, but it it's going to out of any crisis there's uh that thing so on behalf of the legal profession i apologize to the people on this call um, thanks rob um so with that that ends the prepared remarks portion i know we were scheduled to go till noon um so thank you all for attending it and hopefully uh you found this as valuable and, and enjoyable as we did to, to connect with you all uh virtually here with that said, we're going to hang around for a couple of minutes here. There's a few questions in the queue, and certainly if you're able to stay, please do. And if you have questions, um, you know, please jump in. Uh, but again, we went through a lot of topics very quickly. You've got the speaker list here and contact information. So if there were areas that piqued your curiosity, but you wanted to, to maybe reach out and ask a question uh, for a friend, I'll say, a friend's institution maybe, uh, with one of our, our speakers today, please feel free to, to do that post. Uh, but with that, the, the first question in the queue here, and Dean, I'm going to kick it to you, is if there is no term visibility, term, excuse me, if there is no term visibility for borrower cash flow, how does a lender evaluate and then justify accruing income 
uh, during the loan payment deferral period or periods? Yeah, John, um, good question, right? And I guess with, with the guidance that came out both from uh, the interagency statement as well as the CARES Act, um, you know, nothing dictates that you have to maintain that loan on, on approval, right? So um, it's not necessarily an easy analysis to perform, but um, I do kind of fall back to the, you know, the seas of lending in terms of, you know, evaluating the cash flow, if that's gone, um, or perhaps there's a difficulty in evaluating that, what's, what's the collateral and what's the perhaps impact of that collateral given the new environment that we're in? Um, so I, I don't think it's a, a, a one size fits all question and it's definitely a, a challenging analysis to perform. And I, I think you need to think about it, about it in, in the aspect of the, the portfolio on a whole as well, because um, we don't want to set a precedent with one specific um, borrower that perhaps leaves a slippery slope for the rest of the portfolio or a larger portion of the portfolio. Um, but I do think you need you need to go through the process of thinking about the short-term and long-term impact to cash flow and maybe what that time horizon really is to think about the modification needed to, to get over that hump. And uh, again, I, I, I empathize in the idea that it necessarily isn't an easy, easy task to do, but I think those are the things I, I would recommend. Thanks, Dean. And the next question was, if a bank can't get its annual loan compliance audit completed, as scheduled or needs to push it into 2021, how do you think the regulators will react? Uh, I'm gonna take a first pass at this and then ask Mr. Geringer to weigh in. You know, from my perspective and, and from a control perspective, again, you know, we've talked, there's heightened risk with all of our operations and the controls given our shift very quickly to a remote environment. So, you know, my first question would be, you know, back to the, the person asking the question is, you know, can you not complete it because you don't have access to maybe paper documents or is your, uh, the, the firm that's going to complete that audit not able to do it remotely? Um, you know, what's the limiting factor? And I would really uh, want to make sure I documented that, but I still think it's important to the extent you're able to complete some portion of that audit, at least for the higher risk areas during 2020, it is critical to make sure you're doing that, particularly given uh, this remote environment. Um, with that said, John, do you have other thoughts? Yeah, I'd agree with everything you said. You know, we have to be able to walk and chew gum at the same time. And, you know, particularly now when everyone's focus is on pandemic related issues, my biggest worry is that banks take their eye off the ball of all the vanilla banking that uh, controls and auditing and monitoring and systems and training, all those things we have to be doing anyway. You almost have to run two banks. You have to run a, a pandemic related bank and you have to run your regular bank at the same time. So uh, I would echo your thoughts that, that now's the time to be very careful about uh, l loosening up on, on those uh, monitoring, controlling, auditing sorts of things because you know when the examiners come in, they're gonna be keeping an eye um, especially, like you said, on the documentation side, that that makes it harder to um, talk face to face about why you're doing what you're doing. So, to the extent you're having issues, I'd agree with John. Document the hell out of uh, why things are taking longer than normal. Um, also, to the extent that you know your one firm can't help, uh, looking at other firms that can help you out on some of these things. You know that, that there's a reason why you have succession planning, not just with respect to your employees, but you should have succession planning with respect to your third parties as well. And if one can help, you have to make sure that there are others who can. Yeah, thanks, John. I think those are all great points and would, would completely agree. Um, the next question, and, and Lynn, I'm gonna pose this to you and then certainly others uh, from the barracks side, feel free to, to weigh in. Uh, it says, what general advice do you have in the event that OSHA calls as a result of the required reporting to it of COVID cases. What enforcement authority do they have? Um, well, they have significant enforcement authority. They can require you to um, make your workplace safe um, and just simply demand that you do it. Uh, and so shut you down in the, in the worst cases. You think of construction sites that are not safe. They, they have shut them down. So I think here, you always want to be cooperative. Um, there's a lot of discussion about whether this particular virus and its transmission in the workplace reaches the OSHA standards 
for that kind of an imminent danger. So it'll be interesting to see how OSHA approaches that. But for it, my advice is to take the steps to create as safe a workplace as you can following the guidance from the CDC and OSHA itself, most importantly, and you shouldn't be getting calls. Great, thanks, Lynn. And, and then the last question we have here in the queue, it says, follow up resource issues. All my mortgage staff is drowning and other staff are overwhelmed by triple P. And, and so I will say, uh, I'll take first crack and then again, open it up to the panel here. But, um, you know, that's a common conversation we're having with, with financial institutions right now. And it was, again, all hands on deck, as Stan alluded to, to really get through the triple P process on the front end. And certainly, you know, where we've seen rates go and, and mortgages, we've seen a significant demand again in refi activity. And, and so what we've been working with clients on, and certainly uh, I know there's other firms out there with these resources is, is automation. And so for triple P on the forgiveness side, you know, we've developed a, an automated tool that not only allows the bank to uh, process loans in a consistent and efficient manner, it does in a way that really saves time for the staff and reduces the amount of resources involved. With that, we've also seen institutions that have looked at completely outsourcing the forgiveness portion of uh, the, the triple P program. And so I think that's also an interesting approach to address those resource issues. And again, I think we're gonna continue to see those resource challenges in the workforce dynamics as uh, not only the, the we continue to respond to COVID, but life after COVID, uh, as folks really rethink what does work look like and, and what does my organization need to look like to be really prepared to address, you know, the next pandemic or whatever that market disruption is. Uh, and, and so again, I think the more an organization and a bank can leverage digital and automation to, to create those cost reductions and, and long-term cost saves is really going to give them an edge. And I guess, John Freecheck, I'd be curious, maybe I'll kick it to you and then we open it up, you know, what your thoughts are on, on kind of those kind of cost saves and how that plays out uh, as, as you're looking at, you know, maybe transactions today and certainly in the future uh, from an M&A perspective. Yeah, absolutely, John. I mean, and it's going to be a critical factor, as I touched upon earlier, and it's going to be something that you're going to have to really dig into where, you know, you've seen uh, a number of smaller institutions, and we've, you know, heard from some of our clients that are maybe on a, an email list with, with a number of banks that are in their region and kind of how they're managing this. And you've seen that there are, you know, a number of smaller institutions that haven't necessarily had the wherewithal to make the necessary investments to be able to have their staff working from home to be able to really manage this process as you would like to. And it's been a wake up call for them. And so, you know, the, the necessary investments that you will need to make and, and, you know, in terms of evaluating cost savings going forward, you know, that, that is evolving here in terms of what do you need from a technology standpoint? What do you need to be able to, to manage your bank and your customer base efficiently when you have a situation here where you know you can't necessarily step into the branch and so that is going to be a very important element of this going forward and you know that's part of you know kind of the necessary investment and then for some of these larger institutions who do have that in place and don't have to make that investment going forward to the same extent that an institution who really hasn't started that process that's going to be advantage for them where they can squeeze out some some costs in terms of the back office operations of, of a smaller institution and make that acquisition uh, that much more attractive from an earnings per share accretion standpoint going forward through those cost savings. So that's absolutely gonna be a critical element, I think, uh, once we come out of this in terms of M&A activity. Great, thanks, John. And, and so with that, we're at uh, 12 minutes over. So. Certainly uh, want to extend our thanks to all the participants. Uh, thank you to Mary Therese from RSM and Michelle at Barrick for their help in coordinating this on the marketing side uh, and to the panelists. And, and with that, Rob, thank you uh, uh, for your help with this. And, and I'll, I'll turn it over to you for any final thoughts. No, I appreciate, uh, appreciate that, John. I think this was a good conversation and just 
throw it out there. Keep your uh, eyes open on your emails because maybe this is something we can revisit in you know four or five weeks um, as the uh, environment will clearly have changed somehow, um, and maybe we can uh, do a quick update on what we're seeing based on what's going to happen in the next uh, month or so. But I want to thank all the participants as well for um, coming out and listening. And if you have any questions, if you have any follow-up, reach out to any of the panelists, and we'll make sure that we are uh, as responsive as we can to get.